I am Bill Cortright with Living Right with Bill Cortright. And this is the Stress Mastery Podcast, where we take you from the science to the spirituality of stress mastery. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Stress Mastery Podcast. I am Bill Cortright, and I am here with the super millennial David Barreto. Big Dave. Friday. Friday. You know what today is? Birthday. My birthday. You know how old I am? You don't know, do you? I do. Just old. <laughs> Thanks, bud. Know. Thanks, pal. I do Just know. You want to know why freaking I'm... old. You want to know why I would say it, though? Because I can still get my ass kicked. So, look, I have no. rather not say it how old Just a, just is. a number, buddy. Just <laughs> a number. So, 59 today, next year. I was thinking, you know, I was thinking, you know, maybe I'll take this year and get ready for a competition and do one more. At age 60. What do you think of that? Want to train with me? I, I don't would, say it on air. I, I would do it. Yeah, you know, really don't would. say it on air. That is a very... Like, I did I did throw that at your mother. So, can I do one more competition? And she looked at me and she didn't say anything. She just looked at me. You know, that's scary, right? When she don't talk. See, the same way where I was like, you, you, looks like we're going to have to find a room for a trophy in here. <laughs> or two. <laughs> <laughs> so this week... Our topic was overwhelm, and we opened up Mondays with the Super Millennial, and David did a show on why you need to relax. On this week's Health Huddles, we had part three of the lies of weight loss, the overwhelm of trying to lose weight. And a meeting of the minds on Wednesday, we talked on the overwhelm of the pandemic. Yesterday's Connection Thursday, we talked on going from overwhelmed to enlightenment. And today we will continue our book study of Ryan Holiday's Stillness is the Key. David, got anything? I'm excited for this book. I got to say, I really am. Yeah, people really like in the book. And the way we're doing it is we're going to do it in a section and then we'll discuss it. Now, um, announcements. Um, we will have a new wellness survey coming out here very soon. I think you're going to Dr. Brian's office, right? This yeah. week? Yep. So Dr. Brian is looking at it. So we're looking at it. And what we're doing is we are in the process of the Pause Plan Effect program of getting ready to launch the thing to the public. So we are getting everything dialed in. So we're making sure that we have the best information for you. So we'll let you know when that comes out. Also, we're doing module number seven, which we're going to be the dark side and dealing with the shadow. That will also come out next week. So if you're interested, Stress Mastery Community, it's www.stressmasterycommunity.com. Links are right below the show notes. If you want to come in and explore it and see what's going on, come on in. Because everybody's, hey, it's it's rocking. It really is. A lot of new people, which is cool. Yeah, the conversations are awesome. I know really good. Lessons gonna really stir up some conversations. Yeah, they, they all, I all they, they they wanted it, so I'm gonna give it to them. So here we are. We are in the section of stillness is the key. Ryan Holiday's book, and it's called "Limit Your Inputs." It opens up with a quote: "A wealth of information creates a poverty of attention." Herbert Simon, as general. Napoleon made it his habit to delay responding to the mail. His secretary was instructed to wait three weeks before opening any correspondence. When he finally did hear what was in the letter, Napoleon loved to note how many supposedly important issues had simply resolved themselves and no longer required a reply. While Napoleon was certainly an eccentric leader, he was never negligent in his duties, or out of touch of his government or his soldiers. But in order to be active and aware of what actually mattered, he had to be selective about who and what kind of information got access to his brain. It is in a similar vein, he told messengers never to wake him with good news. Bad news, on the other hand, that is to say an unfolding crisis or an urgent development that negatively impacted his campaign was to be brought to him immediately. Rouse me instantly, he said, for then there is not a moment to be lost. These were both brilliant accommodations to the reality of life for a busy person. There is way too much coming at us. No order to think clearly. It is essential 
that each of us figures out how to filter out the inconsequent consensual from the essential. It's not enough to be inclined toward deep thought and sober analysis. A leader must create time and space for it. In the modern world, this is not easy. In the 1990s, political scientists began to study what is called the CNN effect. Breathless, 24-hour media coverage makes it considerably harder for politicians and CEOs to do anything but react. There's too much information. Every trivial detail is magnified under the microscope. Speculation is rampant and the mind is overwhelmed. The CNN effect is now a problem for everyone, not just presidents and generals. Each of us has access to more information than we could ever reasonably use. We tell ourselves that it's part of our job, that we have to be on top of things. And so we give up precious time to news, reports, meetings, and other forms of feedback. Even if we're not glued to a television, we're still surrounded by gossip and drama and other distractions. We must stop this. If you wish to improve, Epictetus once said, be content to appear clueless or stupid and extraneous it matters. Napoleon was content with being behind on his mail, even if it upset some people, or if he missed out on some gossip because it meant that trivial problems had to resolve themselves without him. We need to cultivate a similar attitude. Give things a little space. Don't consume news in real time. Be a season or two behind on the latest trend or cultural phenomenon. Don't let your inbox lord over your life. The important stuff will still be important by the time you get to it. The unimportant will have made its insignificance obvious or simply disappeared. Then, with stillness, rather than needless urgency or exhaustion, you will be able to sit down and give what deserves consideration your full attention. There is ego in trying to stay up on everything, whether it's an acclaimed television show, the newest industry rumor, the smartest hot take, or the hottest crisis in the Middle East, Africa, Asia, the climate, the World Bank, the NATO summit. And there is ego in trying to appear the most informed person in a room and the one with all the gossip who knows every single thing that's happening in everyone's life. Not only does this cost us our peace of mind, but there is a serious opportunity cost too. If we were stiller, more confident, had a longer view, what truly meaningful subject could we dedicate our mental energy to? In her diary in 1942, Dorothy Day, the Catholic nun and socialist act, social activist, admonished herself much the same. Turn off your radio, she wrote. Put away your daily paper. Read one review of events. Spend time reading books. Spend time reading books. That's what she meant. Books full of wisdom. Though this too can be overdone. The verse from John Ferrier. What wild desires, what restless torment sees the hapless man who feels the book disease. The point is, it's very difficult to think or act clearly to say nothing of being happy when we are drowning in information. It's why lawyers attempt to bury other, the other side in paper. It's why intelligence operatives flood the enemy with propaganda so they'll lose the scent of the truth. It's not coincidence that this goal of these tactics is casually referred to as analysis paralysis. Yet, we do this to ourselves. A century and a half later, after Napoleon, another great general, and later, head of state, Dwight D. Eisenhower, struggled to manage the torrent of facts and fiction that was thrown at him. His solution was strict adherence to the chain of command when it came to information. No one was to hand him an unopened mail. No one was to just throw half-explored problems at him. Too much dependent on the stillness within that he needed to operate to allow such haphazard information flow. 
One of his innovations was to organize information and problems into what's now called the Eisenhower box, a matrix that orders our priorities by the ratio of urgency and importance. Much that was happening in the world or on a job, Eisenhower found was urgent, but not important. Meanwhile, most of what was truly important was not remotely time sensitive. Categorizing his inputs helped him organize his staff around what was important versus what seemed urgent, allowed them to be strategic rather than reactive, a mile deep on what mattered rather than an inch on too many things. Indeed, the first thing great chiefs and of staff do, whether it's for the general or the president or the CEO of the local bank, is limit the amount of people who have access to the boss. <laughs> it's your job, right? Yeah. They become gatekeepers. No more drop-ins, tidbits, and stray reports. So the boss can see the big picture. So the boss has time and room to think. Because if the boss doesn't, well, then nobody can. In his meditations, Marcus Aurelius says, Ask yourself at every moment, is this necessary? Knowing what not to think about, what to ignore and not to do, it's the first and most important job. One of my favorite teachers, by the way, is Thich Nhat Hanh. This is the quote. Before we can make deep changes in our lives, we have to look into our diet, our way of consuming. We have to live in such a way that we stop consuming the things that poison us and intoxicate us. Then we will have the strength to allow the best in us to arise and we will no longer be victims of anger, of frustration. It is true of food as it is of information. There's a great saying, garbage in, garbage out. If you want good output, you have to watch over the inputs. This will take discipline. It will not be easy. This means fewer alerts and notifications. It means blocking incoming texts with do not disturb function and funneling emails to subfolders. It means questioning that open door policy or even where you live. It means pushing away selfish people who bring needless drama into our lives. It means studying the world more philosophy that is with a long-term perspective rather than following events second by second. The way you feel when you awake early in the morning and your mind is fresh and as yet unsoiled by the noise of the outside world, that's space worth protecting. So too is the zone you lock into when you're really working well. Don't let intrusions bounce you out of it. Put up barriers. Put up the proper shutting to direct what's urgent and unimportant to the right people. Walker Percy, one of the last great Southern novelists, had a powerful passage in Lancelot based on Percy's own struggle with idleness and addiction to entertainment. In the book, the harried narrator walks outside of his Mississippi mansion and for the first time in years, simply stops. He steps outside his bubble and experiences the moment. Can a man stand alone naked and at his ease, wrist flexed at his side, like a Michelangelo's David, without assistance, without diversion, in silence, he asks? Yes, it was possible to stand. Nothing happened. I listened. There was no sound. No boats on the river. No trucks on the road. Not even city gods. What if... I didn't listen to the news. I didn't. Nothing happened. I realized I had been afraid of the silence. It is this stillness that we can be present and finally see truth. It is this stillness that we can hear the voice inside us. How different would the world look if people spent as much time listening to their conscious as they did to chattering broadcasts? If they could respond to the calls of their convictions as quickly as we answer the dings and rings of technology in our pockets, all this noise, all this information, all these inputs, we are afraid of the silence. We are afraid of looking stupid. We are afraid of missing out. 
We are afraid of being the bad guy who says, nope, not interested. We'd rather make ourselves miserable than make ourselves a priority than be our best selves. Then be still and in charge of our own information diet. So that'll end this section. We have got plenty of time. And next week, we'll start with empty the mind. So, David, there's a lot to cover there. Talk to me. I like this chapter. It's something that I didn't realize that we were coming into in the chapter, and I've done a lot of it myself just because I realized there's a lot of noise. And it's always going to be noise, but it's only if I allow it. Like my phone, every app has been shut off notification-wise. So I still get the notifications, you know, when I open the app, but they don't distract from doing work. That was mm-hmm. a huge thing because I'm like, ooh, what was it? Or I go back to old conversations. Was it this? Was it that? Um, and then I keep my phone and do not disturb. <laughs> I put the people who I need to in my favorites. So if I need to get a hold of you, mm-hmm. Patrick, you know, business partners, things like that, it comes through, right? The important necessities. And afterwards, when I'm not working, I go through it all. It's not an important hour of time. I think that was big. I think a lot of, especially like millennials. I don't know any of my, all my friends think I'm weird that I have notifications turned on. And it's not weird. I'm clear. I have clarity all day long. I agree with you. You know, so we do a lot of that, right? Even our whole workspace is set up that way. And so we're, everything we do is about creating focus. So we talked a lot in Stress Mastery about what focus is. Every single person is focused every single moment. The question is, where is your focus? And so your focus is set by your physiology, your aim. And so you have two possibilities at any moment. Your aim can be resistant or it can be expansive. When the aim is resistant, the focus goes in fear. When you're in a focus of fear, your behavior is reactive. You're reacting to everything. But when your focus is expansive, I'm sorry, when your aim is expansive, your focus is in growth. This is when you're able to respond. So what Ryan Holiday was teaching in this is you've got to protect that focus. So once you get working on something, right, and you're focused in its flow, the moment you have the ding come in or the moment that you break it, It takes, and science has shown, anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes to get back to that flow. And you may not get back to that flow. You may get caught up in, oh, look at the news is happening on this, or this just happened, or this just happened on Twitter, or or, I got a bunch of people liking my Facebook post, and I got to go there. And it takes you out of your purpose, of your work, of your focus. That's what he's saying. So you do have to, in today's world, manually get rid of distractions because we have a lot of distractions. So Dave Conley, who came on the show and talked about his 150 pound weight loss is in the process right now of doing an experiment to detox off technology. Now, you guys might not know this about Dave, but he was one of the early people at AOL. He was one of the first people to put a million, the first million people on the internet. So he's there when all of this started, right? And he said in the beginning, it was always about creating great content so people could have this voice and show their talents and expand. And then what happened is, as they figured out that the algorithms could be set to take people's attention, their focus, right? Mm -hmm. Everything started to change. So everything's not one minute, this minute, that minute, this thing. And that's why everything distracts us so much. So he's going through this experiment. He's going to come on and talk about it because he's actually um, journaling this. But he had such withdrawals from the news, he actually had almost panic attacks. And he'll talk about it. And you think, come on, that's ridiculous. Have you tried to leave your phone somewhere yet? Have you ever tried to leave? Did you ever leave the house and leave your phone? Because if you can't do it, you don't understand. Right? Yeah. You know, it's funny. Uh, I- Two, three weeks ago, I left my phone on the charger, and I was like, where's my phone at? Right? We were in the car already, and they were, he was like, do you need it? And I was like, I don't know. And it was an honest question, yeah. because it was a day off, so I didn't think I would need it for you or work or anything like that, but I was like, do I need it? And the fact that I couldn't answer that question showed how attached I was, even though I didn't need it in that moment, I wanted it on me. I think that's the big thing. I love that he said, every, there's a lot of urgent things, but 
some things aren't important right now. And that's like if you're at a birthday party, if you're at you know dinner with your wife and things, there could be 110 things going on. What's important is what you're doing right now, what's in front of you. And I think that's a big thing because people... I remember I went to uh, uh, one of, it was, I think it was, yeah, it was Brett's championship high school football game, right? It was his championship game, and, and Bobby went with us, right? And Bobby was sitting there, and he kept on going back to his phone and back to his phone. I go, is that an emergency? He goes, no, I just don't want to leave the guy hanging. I go, but you came here and spent time with his kids, right? To see, you haven't watched, you've missed, like, because you're on the phone. See, we actually feel guilty if we don't answer right away like we're not doing something right right and and so that is huge and i can't wait to have dave on the show and talk about that a little bit he's going to talk about some of the research behind it one of the authors that that and i don't want to bring it in now but i want to it's definitely going to be an interesting episode but the other part of this is what napoleon did you guys got and eisenhower You've got to create focus management. You got to know because you got to know what's due this week, what you really need to focus on, right? What's coming this month? What is not yet? Why do you need to focus on something that's out two months from now, right? It doesn't mean you ignore it. So we have what's called focus management. So our we have a focus management system. But we also have it in a board here. And so we got things all over the office telling us what we're focused on. So we know what we're working on. That way it keeps you accountable. But more importantly, you can dial in what needs to be done. What's important this week. Now what has to be done two weeks from now, right? Yeah, it, it's it's funny how everything seems important when we're stuck in that red zone, right? I always think of it like when I ride the motorcycle, I can't answer my phone. It's the same way if I was driving a car, I could I'm not answer my text message here. Answer what's more important? Me crashing on a motorcycle or answering a damn text message. And like he said, it usually resolves itself because I'll go on rides for two hours, three hours. Hey, I need this. Never mind, I got it. That's the same way it could work while I'm in the house, in a car, you know, anything. It can resolve itself. It depends on the importance of it. And for me, in situations like that. It's more important to focus on that. Same thing when you look at like military people who are out in the field, their families are just as important right there. Coming back to them is more important. Well, you know, and what his whole point is, is that by doing that, we're never present. Mm -hmm. We never find our now, right? Because we're always in, in a crisis. We're always in reaction. So the moment that those things go off and you go to them, you change your physiology. You go into red zone immediately. You're in fear. Now, remember, you can't stop that because that is the way the human body works. You can't stop it. It's one one hundred thousand of a second you're going to go in. And the question is, what happens when you get in there? Can you break it or do you get trapped in it? So one of the things in working, I chunk my work. You know when to come in the door, when not to come in the door, especially when I'm working on a book. When I'm working on a book, I can't be bothered. It just can't be bothered because I'm trying to stream. So my phone is put away, everything. There's nothing that, that comes up in that moment when I'm working on a book because I have to write when I have to do content. Nothing. There's nothing that bothers. There, there's no, you, you guys know that. You respect it because that's something you have to do too. You have to set parameters and rules for your life. Like Napoleon said, and this is the same with Eisenhower. Don't hand me an envelope that's not open. You know, what is it? And so you got to set parameters in your life. When, you know, I have a guy that uh, that I work with who owns his own business and everything else. When we started coaching, he couldn't get through a coaching session because if his wife texted him or his kid texted him, he had to stop right away and text him back. I go, why? There's never emergencies. Very, very rarely is there ever, ever an emergency. Why? You're working. And then, this guy was so into the want of approval that every time he would get up and leave his business and go and then wonder why, well, my business isn't doing that good. Why? Because you don't work. You're running around trying to do all these things, but you never, you can't build something. You can't do something well if you can't focus. Focus is about keeping that mind and your physiology in flow. But you can't do that if you're being distracted all around. You've got to set your rules. Everybody's got different rules. 
Every CEO, every executive, every entrepreneur I work with, one of the first things we do is we set up the rules. And this was huge when the virus hit and all of a sudden the executives had to work from home because it was a free free for all and people had to learn how to work from home, right? When does Linda ever bother us while we're working? Me. It doesn't bother me. <laughs> You're the protector. <laughs> I, and I, that's a, how you were saying. There's like there's a few times where I will come and I will say you need to answer this now, but that's no end of difference of something that actually has an urgency and importance together because things are urgent. Yep. There's so many things I need you to do, but I don't need you to do them right right now. now. And yes, I think that's exactly. The things, cause yes, there's a time and place for everything. But we, we were talking about this episode um, on business and focus and things like that. I think uh, people need to learn to set their standards, especially uh, millennials, or if you're a very social person, set your standards with the people that you keep around you, right? If I'm in a group, some people may sound theme, it's boring because people will not gossip to me, period. I'm, I don't listen to it. I don't talk. It sounds rude when I kind of almost don't pay attention to it. So I don't need to fill my brain, my thoughts, or my group of people with gossip. It makes no sense. That's the standard, standard that is set, you know? And I remember one time my dad, because I got, you know, caught up in a whole bunch of stuff in high school, and my dad goes, you don't bother the godfather with gossip. You bother him with things he needs to do. And that stuck with me for, yeah, that's good oh advice. my God. I, when, when I get in a group, if you're talking about somebody or talking about gossip, I don't want to be there. Yep. I'll excuse myself, I'll leave, or you'll be like, man, he's not paying attention. No, I'm still paying attention to what I need to pay attention to. Not your gossip. And, and another thing we talk about, I, I'm starting to pull off of social media a little bit as I have to for my own well-being. I did a post on Facebook and, and saying that used to be able to go to Facebook and get a positive message or put positive things out or see something motivational. Or even if you had an issue, you could put it up. There's nothing. So few posts that are positive, right? That That I can't put my time in there. Because I've got to maintain my focus. I can't worry about your rhetoric about this or that or who is running, who's not running, who. It just it doesn't it doesn't build my life at all with this spew that in there, right? It's just so few people. There's only a few good people that 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 still post. Beta, she just keeps posting positive stuff. I love her. She just keeps on doing it out there, putting it out there. Mark, putting it out there, putting it out there. But there's so much sludge right now in the world. And you, ha that, remember what Ryan said, this will not be easy. It will take discipline. You have to set your parameters of when you're going to do things. And if you're going to do social media, you got to set a clock to it, a time for it. Yeah, especially if you're if you're a person in the place of helping other people. Because we want to feel like we have to deal with everybody's like, negative posts and things like that. I, I, in the beginning, that was I was drained. You Anytime I saw somebody being like negative, how can I help you? How can I do this? No, yeah, you can't. You can't, you can't, just, it's you not can't do it. for me or yep. anyone else. And they don't want to hear it anyways. They yeah. just want to spew, right? So this was on, this, this section was limit your inputs. Next week, our topic is envy. Hmm. That'll be fun, right? And then, and then the book will be the next um, section in the book is empty the mind. Anything else, Dave? No, that's it. That's it for today's show. Our mission here is to create a shift in the planet. You can join us on this mission by simply like, share, and subscribe. Links are right below the show. If you want to check out the community, it's a good time to do it right now. Come on in and see what is happening. We got the new module will be coming out next week on the shadow and the dark side. If you come on in there, 30 days, absolutely free. As always, until next time, stay inspired.